So last Sunday were the Golden Globes and the actor Joaquin Phoenix got up for his acceptance speech and uh, shared something with his fellow actors that um, made Hollywood very upset. And what was it that he said that caused the disruption in Hollywood, that caused offense? Well, here's what he said at the end. He says, it's really nice that so many people have come up and sent their well wishes to Australia, but we have to do more than that, right? It's great to vote, but sometimes we have to take that responsibility on ourselves and make changes and sacrifices in our own lives and hope that we can do that. And then he kind of rambles off, but he, he says, we don't have to take private jets to Palm Springs for the awards sometimes or back, please. It's a little confusing at the end as he was a little confused. <laughs> but why did this cause such like, a frustration? And I, I think at its core, it addresses the problem with Christianity today. It's the problem with social media in regards to social issues we face. It's not enough to talk about issues in our day at parties or events with friends. It's not enough to post something on social media hoping or, or thinking that things will actually change. The power is, is in allowing the issues to do something in you. Allowing the messages we talk about or believe in to do something to us. We have to take that responsibility on ourselves and make changes and sacrifices in our own lives, as Joaquin Phoenix says so prophetically. So in other words, we have to take seriously the implications of the message we believe. We have to take seriously the implications of the message we believe. Today, we're gonna talk about the message of Jesus and the implications it has for our lives today. We're in the Gospel of Luke, and we are doing a series called Jesus According to the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of Luke paints the picture, the message of Jesus a little bit differently than the other Gospels. Each of them have their own kind of perspective, but I, I'm so passionate about getting this right getting Jesus right, getting his message right. So I'm not here to give you like five points on how the message is gonna change your life. I'm here to preach the gospel to you. And I'm, I want you to soak in the scripture and understand the depth that it has for us and give you context for 2,000 years ago and allow that to just be in your mind as you go about your life in the next few weeks. So each week we're going to give you a picture of Jesus and today it has, happens to be his message and the implications of his message. So we'll start off in Luke chapter 4 verse 14 uh, where we picked up last week Bill talked about Jesus being uh, baptized and then he, uh, a dove rests on him and the father speaks and he's filled with the Holy Spirit and then it says the spirit of the Lord leads him to be tested by Satan and then we finish that, and it goes to verse 14. Check this out. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. So pause right there. I want to just show you something. Luke chapter 1. Luke, more than any other gospel, will make sure you know Jesus is a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't start his ministry. He doesn't do anything in ministry until he's energized, baptized, filled to the full measure of the presence of God, his Holy Spirit. It says he's conceived through the Holy Spirit. It says that he's baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. It says he's led by the Holy Spirit. And now it says he comes back from being tested in the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? He's, he's now a different man. He, he, he went to the desert where he's tested and he comes back anointed. And because look at what now it says. It says, verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. So he begins his ministry. He's preaching in the synagogues and everyone praised him. Now, I just want to show you, give you like the, the quick like, here's what's going to happen moment in the sermon because he preaches this will be like a recorded sermon that Jesus gives and it goes south really fast. It says that everyone praised him and then skip down to verse 22. At the end of the first part of his sermon, verse 22, it says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came out of his lips. Isn't that what every pastor and preacher wants to hear? <laughs> and then skip down to verse 28. Part two of his sermon and then verse 28. 
All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. I've not had a sermon that bad, ever. (laughs) Yet. (laughs) But maybe I'm not fully anointed. I know Jesus is different than me. I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, but I definitely have not been, somebody didn't try to kill me after I preached a sermon. Someone tried to stab me once at Cohiba, but that was a different story. (laughs) From when we started our church at a nightclub, it was a little different than the middle school. True story, that was a true story. Actually, someone did try to stab me here, that's true. Yeah, with a raptor claw, yeah. (coughs) We tell these funny stories of our city. (laughs) So it starts off, I guess, you know, as we talk about the message and the implications, the way I want to frame today is just answer this question, why do they try to kill him? Why did they try to kill Jesus? It's his first sermon. <laughs> Give the guy a break. He's learning. He's, he's just getting started. He's just the age at 30 where rabbis begin their ministry. Why do they try to kill him in his hometown? Let's, let's figure that out together. So verse 16. So in the power of the Holy Spirit, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he's in his hometown. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He's doing what he does every week. He stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah that was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners to recovery and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them after he sat down, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 22 part A, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Pause right there. So what's going on here? What's going on in the message of Jesus? Because it's so important for us to understand what Luke is trying to do. He, Jesus is beginning his public ministry and he wants you to understand the context of what he's about to do as the Messiah. He wants to give you uh, a vision for what is about to take place. And, and it, it says he, he, he's, he, he's handed a scroll. There's no verses in chapters. So he, he's used to scrolling. He probably had Isaiah memorized. He just, he probably, he's probably like an Isaiah 2. And he's like, well, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, blah, 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 blah. Boom. I mean, sincerely, most rabbis at that point would have the entire Old Testament memorized. So the Spirit of the Lord had anointed Jesus. He's now empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he wants to frame his mission. And it's his state of the union for the rest of the book of Luke. It's his Nazareth manifesto. He stands up. He quotes the prophet Isaiah, a prophetic vision of the coming new age the release from slavery, the new exodus, the restoration after exile, which formed the hope that sustained much of the Jewish life during his day. But there's some layers to this that we don't really get because we're not inundated in the vision of Isaiah today. We don't live with this longing of hope of God to show up and do something. So there's three elements you need to understand in this Isaiah passage that he quotes that, you, that are significant. Number one, in this passage, Jesus immediately reveals he's the Messiah. Number two, Jesus' role in bringing liberating news to the poor, the blind, the slaves, and the oppressed. So Jesus says, he brings good news. Can we just pause for a moment and think about the kind of news we bring to the world in our life? Christianity is marked by the announcement of good news. I read the news every day and it definitely doesn't feel good ever, pretty much. In In fact, there's one magazine I get the week that actually has, it wasn't all that bad in the week magazine. It's my favorite part. Because good stories that you don't really read in the headlines. 
But good news, and he, he, he lists it off. He's, he's good news for the poor, the down and out, the forgotten, the vulnerable. He brings comfort to the brokenhearted and the depressed, the anxious, rest for the overworked, comfort for those living in despair and hope for them. He doesn't come bringing religion. He comes to set you free from religion. He comes to bring you freedom. He comes to transform your life is what he's saying in these verses. He comes to bring about transformation wherever you live, wherever you find yourself. Remember, when you, whenever you see a quote in the New Testament, you need to take the entire chapter, the entire context of that quote. Don't take chap, uh, chapter 61, verse one and two. You need to read all of 61. You need to read all of 61 and see what happens with these poor, broken, once enslaved, once imprisoned people. They become oaks of righteousness. They become the people that will rebuild Israel. They become the rebuilders, the restorer of streets. They become the people God will use for the new age. Transformation of culture, transformation of society, transformation of cities, transformation of the world through the people that you never expected to bring it. Today, oh, and number three, what's going on in this message? It's the proclamation of God's favorable year here and now, jubilee is another word that you can use there. The expectation of Isaiah 61 is transformation. And Jesus says, today, this prophetic vision of what's to come has been fulfilled in your hearing. When he says that, he's saying to his brothers and sisters, his community of friends that would bring work to him as he was a stonemason. Carpenter, you read carpenter, but the word in Greek is a stonemason. There wasn't a lot of carpentry work back then. So I'm, that might destroy your image of Jesus, but he was, he was a stonemason most likely. That's the technical work. He was a, he was a Bob the Builder. Because Jesus would be the equivalent of the name Bob in our context or John in our context. Nothing against you, John, or any John or Bobs in the world. But it's just an, an, a regular name that has lots of significance, which we don't have time to get into. But it's just Bob the Builder from Nazareth. That's who Jesus was. Bob the Builder from the 909, right? Where am I 909? You're in good company with Yahweh in the flesh. So it's not just Isaiah 61 I want to draw your attention to because what they would have heard is this idea of jubilee. Jubilee, which is uh, found in the, first, uh, in the three books, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus. And those books describe this legislation of jubilee vision. And here's a quote from one scholar. He says, scholars aren't sure if the jubilee actually fell on the 49th or the 50th year. Either way, the year of Jubilee celebrated the end of the seventh seven-year period. To summarize, the Sabbath ended a six-day week. The sabbatical year ended a week of six years. And Jubilee ended a week of sabbatical years. So in the Old Testament, you take a Sabbath after the sixth day. So on the seventh day, you take a Sabbath. In the Old Testament, after six years, the seventh year is a sabbatical year. You let the land rest. And seven, seven years, seven sabbatical years, 49 or 50, was the year of Jubilee. It was a significant year. Three things happened. Number one, land was given a vacation. Number two, slaves were released from slavery. Debts were erased. And the biggest thing is the land that was owned at that point in time, um, wh wherever it fell on the 49th or 50th, was given back to the people that originally had it 49 or 50 years ago. Now, what this is, is built into the law, God's compassion God's heart and love to ensure that the people of God are not mistreated by wealthy land or owners who will oppress the poor. What's built in is this um, compassionate legislation that ma we make sure that everyone has enough, that we make sure our hearts are not attached to our things, that we make sure that we don't become an empire like Egypt. So the Sabbath or the Jubilee was the reconstruction of social, political, relational, spiritual, real, financial realities. It was built into the law. Scholars don't think it was ever practiced. 
Do you wonder why? Who wants to do that? We have built the American vision on the opposite of that. This is what Jesus is saying. There are serious implications to the way Jesus comes about and brings his ministry of the kingdom of God. There are all sorts of Old Testament frustrations. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, even Nehemiah, the great rebuilder of the Old Testament, rebukes Israel for not observing Jubilee or sabbatical year or the Sabbath. If you read Isaiah 58, it talks about true worship. It talks about not caring for the poor, uh, uh, not, uh, not getting um, worship right by, by neglecting your neighbors and your friends, but it also talks about not observing the Sabbath. There's something about becoming the people that are formed, not by what we do or what we produce or what we acquire. Wow, I didn't realize how serious this was gonna get. But who we are because of him. The theme of restoration links together the Jubilee and Jesus' Nazareth sermon. Things will be restored, returned to their original state. Images of paradise, no debts, amen. No poverty, amen. No slavery, shine forth. These images of the garden take us back to Genesis and creation. Enacting the Jubilee vision will restore things to their original garden perfection. I love it. I didn't write this, this is a, a famous scholar. Jubilee, talk, it just gives me more affection for the name garden. Jubilee talk also clarifies the role of the Messiah, the one who announces God's release. The Messiah lets us go, forgiving our debts, redeeming our sins. Jesus Christ remolds us into the image of God. He cuts the chains of our sin. Our eyes open. The handcuffs of evil drop off. This is true liberation. We repent, turn back to the garden, rekindling harmony with God, finding a place once more in God's family. And so at Nazareth, Jesus announced God's acceptable year of salvation. This is the message of Jesus, the long-awaited fulfillment that Jesus begins here in Nazareth. This is everything everyone's been waiting for. The world is going to be restored, reconstructed. He is the Messiah. This is his mission. It's powerful. The message is significant. It's gonna transform lives, society, the community, and the world. But it's not the message that gets Jesus into trouble. It's not claiming that he's the Messiah. It's not using Isaiah 61 or even hinting at Jubilee that will get Jesus killed. It's the implications of this message that get Jesus into trouble. It's, Jesus doesn't leave room for this message to be spiritualized. He doesn't leave room for, to make this a political statement or sanitized by his fellow Nazarite or Nazareth friends. He gives us the radical implications. He tells us how far this thing has to go for this to fully make sense. The power of the message Message is in the implications for every li everyday life. The power of the message of Jesus is in the implications for everyday life. It's kind of like why the show Extreme Home Makeover was so popular. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Extreme Home Makeover, for those of you that didn't watch the show, maybe you were too young, I have good news. In my research of this this week, I found out that in February of this year, they're relaunching the show. You're welcome. Good news awaits you. <laughs> Extreme Home Makeover, at its core, all it is is a remodel show. That's all they do. Essentially, the show is a house is run down and they give you a new house. That, and it became the most popular show on television in top 15 in its time. Um, and people loved the show, not because of how cool the houses were. They love the show because of the implications of the house. And if you don't know the show, each episode featured a family that had faced some sort of recent ongoing hardship, a natural disaster, or family member was facing a life-threatening illness. They needed hope. They sent the family on a vacation, and the show's producers worked with local construction contractors, and within a week, they completed a complete house remodel with the support of volunteers and the community. Sometimes they would tear the entire thing down to rebuild a new house. It's simply a remodel show. At the end of the day, this is what they do. Here's the old picture of a house. They do this, and they make it this. <sighs> Go back to the old one. 
So we got the old one, and then there's the before and there's the after. Ah, oh my gosh. It's so amazing. You see, now, here's why this is so powerful. It's the implications. There's this, I was Googling the, the best of all the shows, so I'm going to give you the best one, the Frisch family. They have three biological kids. This couple goes to Haiti and serves in an orphanage and sees the despair and the, the poverty and the brokenness, and they choose to adopt five boys from an orphanage. They come home, and it's going great, and they realize that they, in their hometown, Toledo, there's some serious issues. So they adopt three more boys, making that 13 kids. Then, and they said, and I quote, they want to make the world a better place one child at a time. The mom gets diagnosed with a connected tissue disorder. She needs five major surgeries. She has three strokes, and one of them paralyzes her on the left side. She has a long recovery. The father's a firefighter working alone. He's the only breadwinner for his family. And to, in order to eat together, they have to pull out folding chairs in the garage. Okay, this is the story of the family. They got this house. Watch the reaction when they see the house. Getting out of the movie was like, a nervous, exciting moment. Everybody's cheering, everybody's yelling. We don't know what to think, because you know, in Haiti, everybody's just trying to survive. A lot of children don't go to school. Many people don't eat every day. So to be able to come to the United States and have everything open to you, it took us a long time to realize it was not a dream. We were like pinching ourselves. <laughs> he went through something really tough in your life that you didn't know if you were going to make it through. I know you've had lots of worries. I'm hoping what's behind this bus is going to ease some of those worries you have. Do you want to see what's behind this bus? Move that bus! Move that bus! Move that bus! Well, you guys know what to say. Say it with me. Bus driver! the whole makeover show. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Okay, so, hold on, hold on. Uh, so that's how they see, um, that's their reaction. So you're, uh, anyone crying right now? Like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like, I, I think I, we were watching it in our office. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm in the corner crying. You guys have to see this. Like, everyone's eating lunch crying. <laughs> and then we find out it's coming back and we can't wait. <laughs> it's the implications, right? It's not the house. It's what it means for the family. And, and, and what's amazing about this show is like the, they, they walk them through each room and they go in the before and after. But always at the end, there's something else. I want to show you the last bit. Here's, so, here's after they walk in. Oh, you got to see this I mean, part. I cannot be more grateful. This house will enable my children to be able to have a place to call home so that they can do whatever they're going to do to make a difference in this world. The community has truly been phenomenal. And so many people heard your story. The University of Toledo also heard your story. And they want to do something incredible. In fact, they're going to make sure that all your kids get a full ride scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> My dreams Listen to, this. to go to college and then go back to Haiti and give back everything that you guys here given to me in America. We just want to thank Extreme Home Makeover for just opening the heart to us. If we could find a word that it's more than thank you, that's what we would use. I can't believe this is happening. All right, so no more tears yet. It's like, 
not only do they pick a family in the, the worst situation, they, they change their home, which then changes their life. And then on top of that, it's like the community gets involved and like, we're gonna make sure that your 13 kids have a full ride to university. It's, it's the implications that made this show so amazing. It's not, oh, cool, look at the remodel. It's like, oh my goodness, what this means for this family in this moment for the rest of their life. That's what the gospel has the power to do. It's not meant to be sanitized. It's not meant to be looked at from afar and talked about like it's a subject. It's supposed to come in and transform everything. The power is in the implications for everyday life. The message of Jesus is more than words. It's more than, it's truth and truth that has to be lived out. It has to be experienced. It has to be experienced and brought into the, the transformation of your everyday life. You have to like eat it and let it take its course. And this is why it gets him killed. This is why they can't stand what he says next. So all the 22a, it says they, they couldn't believe what was coming out of his lips, gracious words coming out of his lips. And then the very next thing is 22b. Um, isn't this Joseph's son? Wait, isn't this our homeboy? Like, he, he's over here fixing our house. Literally, Bob the Builder, right? He's, he's literally... We, we give him money to like fix the toilet. He's saying he's the, no, that's not what's frustrating. Look what he says now. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Phys physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And this is where he nails the coffin. I assure you that you were, uh, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious. When they heard this, they got up, drove him out of the town. They took him to the brow of the hill where the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. It wasn't his time. The people who will benefit from the good news are not just the Israelites, the outsiders, the sinners, those far from God, the Gentiles. God's plan doesn't match the plan the audience had in mind. So perhaps in this moment, we have to recognize Jesus' implications of his message disappoint the community he preached to. Two illustrations are so offensive in first century context, Israel. Old Testament is showing on both times a moment where God is placing judgment on Israel. Israel, the people of God, are not acting like the people of God. What happens in a moment of, of two prophet stories? Elijah heals or provides for a widow who's a Gentile in a region outside of the, prom, uh, outside of the land of God, uh, the, the promised land, excuse me. And then there's this Gentile general from the enemy army of Syria who's not just healed of leprosy, he's cleansed, which is an Old Testament word for being accepted by God. It's offensive. You Israel, in other words, have missed it. Your judgment is that the favor of God is going outside of the people of God. The favor of God, judgment on the church, is that revival comes. People get saved at Kanye concerts. That's judgment on the church. We miss what God is doing in the church. We make it about we gotta get Jesus' message on our political side. I want my, the vision for my life to be blessed by his message. I want, I want to take this bit and p this piece of healing, this little bit of wholeness, we're gonna, we're gonna sanitize it and make it about prosperity and health. We're gonna make about following Jesus about it keep getting better, it keeps just getting better. Our best life now your best life now might be death on a cross. Amen. As long as you're being obedient all the way there. 
You see, the message of Jesus uh, didn't fit into the vision of their good life, their vision for what God was like. He insults their ideas. They want to, for him to simply make sense of their own personal dreams and goals. They want Jesus to fit their expectation of what God's like and what the Messiah is supposed to do and act orderly. He wants, they, they had vision of God destroying their enemies. And it, Jesus stops, and if you keep reading Isaiah 61, the very next verse is the day of uh, vengeance. Jesus says, I don't bring vengeance, I bring forgiveness. I don't bring condemnation, I bring salvation to the world. And anyone that wants to build a religion where th- there's us versus them, us versus them, will be offended by the message of Jesus. Jesus doesn't take sides. He doesn't leave room for debate. You can't take this message and gain something for your personal life. You, this, this message requires that you surrender your life. To surrender the way you think the world works and the way the, that God works because you have to reimagine that around the way of Jesus. You can't possibly turn Jesus' message into your favorite political party. You, there are no nationalistic dreams in the message of Jesus. You can't apply this to your personal family. This message transcends boundaries. It transcends parties or groups. It is for everyone always, especially those on the outside, especially those that have been excluded by any political power or religious power. Jesus comes and says, I bring forgiveness. Jesus comes and says, I bring salvation. Jesus comes and says, I bring it to your enemies, and then they try to kill him. It's the power of implications. So what do we do? What do we do with this today? What do, we, what do we need to see out of this text? And this is what I've been wrestling with. I'm struggling with it, and I finally got it. The message of Jesus requires response, period. You just heard the message. Whatever you got from this, you just heard it proclaimed. It requires you to do something about it, and scriptures reveal there's only two possible things you can do, accept it or reject it. You either accept it and the implications and follow Jesus as a disciple, transforming your very existence in life to the cross and letting him reimagine everything about you or you take him to the top of the cliff in your life and you throw him off. But then I realized there's a third way that we invented and it's worse than rejecting it. It's just, it's the same outcome, but it's worse. It's what missionaries throughout history have called syncretism. You see, syncretism is when uh, you combine different religions to work together. It's the uh, amalgamation of two different things. So missionaries would go to different places around the world and bring Jesus and the gospel and those different indigenous groups would just add Jesus to their their religion or their, their, their Hinduism. There'd just be another God to them, another deity, not realizing that that's the one true God, the only God. The old way has to die and the new way has to come. It's called syncretism. And today it's called cultural Christianity. I like to call it the way of compromise. So rather than rejecting Jesus' message or fully following him as a disciple, we made Jesus into our own image. We sanitize the message to make it more palatable for our liking. We create a comfortable industry and a social club of community to keep up this fake image of Jesus. He looks like this. (laughs) Buddy Jesus. Cross is too offensive. Discipleship, too hard for us. Just let me be a Christian, which means little Christ, not a follower of the way. And so we just go about our daily life. We make work the priority, our family the priority, and we forget that we have a God who wants to reorder everything, reconstruct, and if it's really bad, get rid of the foundation, dig it up, and give us a new foundation. See, we compromise compromise the message and the way of Jesus all sorts of places in the church. I'm just gonna name a few and then we'll, we'll worship, okay? So for example, we read Ephesians 5 verse three. Check this out. Do we have that verse? Oh, yeah, you do. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity of, or greed because there are, they, these are improper for God's holy people. Stay right there for a moment. Okay, not even a hint, a whiff of sexual immorality. This is what it means to follow the way of Jesus. That the people of God are so turned upside down that their bodies are now instruments of righteousness. 
Sexuality, of course, according to Paul, is defined as any sexual activity outside a covenantal relationship between a man and a woman. So any sexual expression outside of that covenantal relationship. So what we do in the way of compromise is, well, is oral sex? No, they're talking about sex sex. We start making lists on how far we can go. It says don't look at a woman in a lustful way. You commit adultery in your heart. Well, we just compromise the way and message of Jesus to make it work for our preference, our lifestyle, our, our cultural ideas. It's a little hard to reserve my sexuality for marriage. We live in a different age than back. They got married at like 16. I hear this all the time. I hear Christians talking about practicing to make sure it works before they get married. You can't do that. I'm talking about sex. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah, cover earmuffs in the front row. <clears throat> Next verse. Sorry. <laughs> Mama, what's that? <laughs> no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Ha! I'm going to try. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean? I'm not, I don't love money. I just, my entire existence feels better when I have lots more of it. Church, there, you know, it's, uh, you read in the third century Ephesus, a bishop writes to the local pastor where a famous celebrity actor from the uh, arenas in the, in the theaters became Christian. Famous actor becomes Christian. The, he was a cultural influencer. And they tell him that the church should support him financially because acting at that time was connected to deity worship. He needs to leave his industry, which was worshiping pagan gods through the theater. That's how they saw it. It wasn't like today, like art expression. He has to leave that industry, and he doesn't have to be in need because the local church is going to provide for all of his needs. That was written in the third century. Can you believe that? Imagine if we said to our brothers and sisters that are prostitutes in our city, we're going to provide for you financially as the church. Or whatever industry is caused to be corrupted. Now it's like every industry is corrupted at some level. It is. But, but the level of intentionality of Christ's devotion was so deep that it cost them money. How are we doing, church? Are we awake? It's, you see, you didn't want to kill me when I was talking about blessed good news for the poor. You start talking about my wallet, and now I'm going to drive you off the cliff. That's exactly what Jesus experienced. Or you talk about forgiving Iranian terrorists? This message is for them. That God is on the side of Iran because he's on the side of all human beings because they're all his kids. And we want to choose sides. War is never an option, brothers and sisters. In the kingdom of God, love your enemy. What's the next verse? Oh, right here. I put it up here. It says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. We'll get to the Sermon on the Mount, which will wreck all of us. It's just the words of Jesus. Is it crazy that we have grown technologically? We have grown uh, in health. We've grown in every industry except morality. Anyways, that's a little, for all of you questioners out there. We can talk about gossip. There's a lot about gossip. In the, about what we're not supposed to gossip. And we just, what we do in cultural Christianity is like, hey, I don't want to gossip, but I'm re really worried about so-and-so. Tell me what you think about what happened between us. That is gossip. Gossip is anything that doesn't leave somebody more elevated in your image of them when you leave. Gossip is... If you, if you don't leave a conversation about someone else where that person is lifted up, you are gossiping. No unwholesome word comes out of a Christian's mouth. That's what's expected. Now I'm just, think, literally there's a list of all the unwholesome words yesterday. I'm struggling like you are to move forward. So 
We can't change the message of Jesus. We can't bend his words to empower our lifestyle or bend it to empower our preference or our politics or anything for that matter. We have to simply accept it, reject it, or compromise it. And so when we fail to to actually take it for what it is, we fail to grasp Jesus for who he is, to take his message for what it is, we worship a false God. You see, cultural Christianity is, is simply a form of idolatry. Cultural Christianity is idolatry. It's worshiping the wrong God. It's that simple. And it's all over the place in our lives. It's in the big things and it's in the not so obvious things. So the question is, where have you compromised the implication of Jesus' message in your life? Are the people that you exclude? Have you allowed your preferences or habits to compromise the life he wants for you? Have you made Jesus into your own image, celebrating your victory and your success and your prosperity? Have you sanitized his controversial message in order to simply fit in? So the message requires response. How will you respond? How will you respond to the message of Jesus? Let's pray.